All right, we're on. We're on, we're on. Good afternoon. This is Pastor Kevin Yoakum. I'm from coming from Christ the King Lutheran Church here in Riverview, Florida. Uh, if, if anybody's watching from not Riverview, Florida, or not one of the surrounding suburbs of this sprawling metropolis that is Riverview, Florida, if anybody's from away somewhere, give me a note, give me a comment or, or uh, something. Send me a, a, just, hey, I'm watching. Now, is it because I'm going to follow up with you and try to tell you that your extended warranty is overdue? No, I'm just curious. That's all. I promise. Nothing weird. No, I won't. I won't come back at you, unless you're my good friend Mark. I want to tell you about my Mark, my friend Mark. Uh, my friend Mark. We went through seminary together, so he's a pastor. I'm a pastor, and uh, he is now uh, a really big, high, smart man at the Concordia Seminary. And so uh, I hope uh, this isn't going to get him in trouble, but he was watching this show one time, this Bible study one time, and I found out that, uh, a, you know, a, my friend and a fellow pastor was watching it, you know, and you can, uh, you, you sometimes feel judged if you feel like uh, another trained professional is watching you. And I said, I know I, I'm not always the most academic of teachers, and he says, I'm, I'm around academic people all day long, Kevin. I wanted to listen to you. <laughs> uh, I, I hear smart people all the time. Let's hear from Kevin, who's not so smart. No, that's not what he said. He said, I just enjoy hearing from the pastor who serves the parish, right? Not who is trying to teach the books. And it's nothing against the, the faculty of Concordia Seminary St. Louis. They're uh, among the best, all right? Among the best. And right alongside them, I would probably put the Concordia, the faculty of Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, uh, because I, we've got some really top-notch professors. We really do. Um, so anyway, uh, so uh, here we are. And if you're from out there somewhere, outside of the great metropolis of Riverview, uh, let me know where you're at. Uh, just kind of send a note or a comment or something, uh, and uh, be happy to know who's watching from where. Uh, anyway. Uh, that's just a little little note there. I'm, I really am curious, where does the Word of God get uh, spread out even beyond because of this great thing we have called uh, YouTubes and Facebooks and Internets and things like that. Uh, so uh, if you want to leave a comment sometime and just let me know where you're from, that'd be really interesting. I'd love to know that. Um, as we get into our Bible class today, we are. this is the Book of the Month Bible Study. That's why it's got that cool name, BOMBS, B-O-M-B-S, Book of the Month Bible Study. And we are, our book this month is Hebrews. Now, we've been doing this, you know, read for a month, take a month off to do a different book, whatever. We've been doing this for a while, and uh, I think, well, what I actually know... <laughs> Hebrews 13 is our chapter today, and there's no chapter 14, and there's no chapter 15, and we have two more Sundays in November. What are we going to do with our time? Uh, if we finish a book, do we just stop and up uh, with no more Bible study for the month of November? <laughs> no, hopefully not. Um, hopefully, no, I know what we're going to do. Uh, so next week, we'll just pick up with a different book. And uh, since we've been going through the book of John, we'll probably just pick up next week through the book of John and take that through December as well. Uh, I've mentioned uh, before of trying to do this back and forth between books. Uh, I, I'm coming around to maybe this works, and maybe maybe one idea is like an Old Testament, New Testament, Old Testament, New Testament, and maybe just four weeks, four weeks, and we take what we get. Uh, I don't know. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you have ideas. Um, uh, if it's Book of the Month Bible Study, bombs, do I have to change the name if I change the format? I don't know. Uh, so, uh, but let's get into this here. This is a really good, fun chapter. Uh, fun. <laughs> it's the Word of God. Uh, and and uh, as one of my professors has said, in technical theological language, the Bible is cool. <laughs> right? Now, he's actually very true. My, my professor is very smart and very wise. And so... Uh, in his wisdom, and by, by the time when he said this, he wasn't like some ancient old man. Um, 
And, and so uh, he said, the Bible's cool. And you got to admit, if you are a believer, when you read the Bible, you find some astounding, amazing things. And you actually enjoy some of what you read. And you, you go, look at everything that's in here. So we shouldn't discount uh, the Bible too much when we read it and go, oh, it's just an old stuffy book for, from, old, from of old. And what does it have to do with us today? I think we'll see it, okay? So let's begin with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you that uh, you give us this time to come to your word. And we thank you that as we uh, read Hebrews 13 today, that we will be able to hear of your will and your promises and your encouragement into the life of a Christian, even today. Uh, we ask that you would bless us during this hour in Jesus' name. Amen. And I got to see your comment, Edith, and where you're from. So thank you for posting that and sharing that as well. Um, and we come into Hebrews chapter 13. Now, if this is the end of, the, of Hebrews. This is the end of the epistle to Hebrews. Uh, remember, a, an epistle is a letter. So this is the end of someone's letter. Now, if you remember back when we used to write letters... It might say things, you know, we might go with, oh, hello and good morning and the sun outside is shining. You know, this is how we would today write a letter. You know, we would come in with a nicety, you know, uh, the, the, the flowers are blooming on this day and, it, I, and I'm writing you a letter, right? Um, my, my grandfather was in a chaplain in the army in World War II. And uh, so he was in France in 1945. And uh, uh, we got a letter in our family records and things, and it, it says, uh, Dear Margaret, that's my mom, uh, I had Palm Sunday services today, but no one came, none of the soldiers came to church. So I've gone back to my tent to write you this letter. Now, I, I think, uh, for one, historically, it's really cool that I've got a letter from France in 1945 on Palm Sunday to my mom who was about five, probably five at the time and and uh, that's really neat then you go oh it's sad that soldiers didn't come to Palm Sunday services well I don't know what was happening to, in France on Palm Sunday 1945 uh, it might have been kind of hard to, to take time off you know so I don't want to convict any of the soldiers uh, for not making it to church on Sunday in 1945 during Holy Week uh, we don't I don't know the circumstances but uh, you know I also think of a pastor and he would say I worked so hard to present this and there's no one able to come uh, you know okay well, we'll do what we can anyway so a letter that's being written you might start off with some sort of lead-in nicety and uh, you know uh, for the reason of the letter then you get to the meat of the letter and then maybe the way we write letters today you would say at the end something like now uh, make sure you look after your mother and be good to your sister and obey your teachers and uh, get some exercise <laughs> I don't know you know we might end with a few things of just like final notes that are kind of tying it up but make sure this happens right so now go back 2,000 years paper is expensive bringing a paper out to a church you know delivering the mail is not as easy as putting a stamp on it today that only costs 40 cents or something like that whatever it costs today um, you know so a letter was much more valuable but we're gonna get to see here chapter 13 still has this tying it up kind of a sound to it but still in tying it up these are important things worth saying right you know uh, be good to your mother make sure you brush your teeth uh, you know don't don't beat your sister too hard don't beat your sister at all, right? And obey your teachers, right? It, those, those are kind of a little laundry list of some behaviors that uh, actually whoever's writing that letter would say. This is important. It wasn't the whole reason for writing the story, but you need to know this too, right? And by the way, behind my dresser is an envelope full of unmarked $100 bills. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just going off here. Let's get into the story here of Hebrews chapter 13, and let's see how do they end a letter. Kind of in the same way with saying, here's some final details that are important, okay? <coughs> Hebrews chapter 13. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. 
Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. <coughs> let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from the love of money, and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? All right, so uh, this first paragraph, it kind of get a little bit of a laundry list. He's tying it up here, and, but he wants some uh, encouragement or some reminders to go out to those uh, in, in the congregations that he's sending this to. Now, uh, a little back up, um, who's he? The writer, the author of the letter to the Hebrews. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, some people think it might be Paul. And some people make a good case for Paul. Uh, I think maybe Luther thought it was uh, Barnabas. Some people might say Apollos. Oh, and my whether it was Luther or not, I'm not. I could be wrong, because uh, he could have said Paul or he could have said Apollos. So some people would say Paul. Some people would say Barnabas or Apollos. And, and one a new one that I've heard recently, and I don't know if this is new like this week or it's just new to me, but it's been long held. Maybe it was John, who's also written a good few sorts of letters, um, and. Um, I don't know. He, the author to the Hebrews is not named. Now, which Hebrews are, is he writing to? All of them. It's an open letter to all the, the Jews, to all the Hebrews, who may have come to faith in Christ and then are considering falling back into the old Jewish ways and taking up the laws again. You know, the, this is said, Moses. he's better than Moses, he's better than angels, he's better than the temple, he's better than, he's the once and final sacrifice. You know, he's better, he's better, he's better, he's better than Melchizedek. Um, and so, it, uh, who's writing this? Uh, maybe someone that everybody knows, but us. Um, and who's he writing to? All the Jewish people. And this letter certainly proclaims Christ. And so, uh, how does he end this? What does he want everyone to know? Let brotherly love continue. You have to love each other as brothers. Uh, my thing that I like to tell people is, that's my brother in Christ or my sister in Christ, and I'm going to live with them forever in eternity. I might as well start getting along with them now, <laughs> right? Uh, that we recognize, you know, I, there's no separating us in in time and maybe temp you know in in this life we might be separated in space you know that they, they've gone their way and i've gone my way but eventually we're going to come back and be uh in in the final days in heaven in, in the last days and, in, and into eternity is what i'm trying to say fulfilled finally perfect and loving each other in heaven so shouldn't I try to love my brother now? So let brotherly love continue. All right? You have to get along with people. Don't say, I'm going to stir up more hate. How can we stir up more love? Right? Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Ew, this is hard for me uh, as a 20th century American, 21st century American. Now, I'm not saying I, I reject it. No, this is God's word directed at us. Show hospitality to strangers. Be kind. Open the door for, for a stranger, right? But now hospitality will also mean, can you extend yourself maybe in a sacrificial way to strangers? In their culture, showing hospitality to strangers would be to welcome them into your house if they need a place. To give them a meal if they need a meal. To give the beggar some bucks if he needs a couple bucks. Back then, uh, being a beggar had no shame. It wasn't supposed to be a shameful thing. It was told, even in the scriptures, that the beggars can sit there and ask for money. And that the good people are supposed to support them with alms, 
with offerings to, to help them get by. Now today in our culture, uh, we're more uh, paranoid and, and we say, uh, oh, these beggars are just gonna waste my money. Well, that's kind of not my call. I've been called to to offer them my alms, right, my offerings. And they're, or they're just, they're scam artists. They don't really need it. And you've heard the stories about the beggars that go and get in their uh, suburban after they're done for begging for a day and then drive home in their suburban. And why, okay, those exist, but the command of God is still there that we should care for those uh, strangers or beggars or people in need, right? But here he even says, show hospitality for strangers because some have entertained angels and they didn't even know it. Now, I don't know what that means, except it says what it says. But somehow, there were people that were entertaining angels by simply showing kindness to a stranger, showing hospitality to a stranger, and lo and behold, they were showing hospitality to an angel. You know, what do you do with that? I don't know. It's really important to know that, but I, I don't know. Uh, so, but there's that encouragement. Uh, be kind, show hospitality. I know a pastor who said, I just always keep a few bucks in my car. Um, it's not for me to judge, he essentially was saying, uh, who, how they're going to use it, but if it looks like someone's in need, I, I just always kind of keep a few bucks for the poor, for the needy, for the stranger who might be asking for help. Uh, now, you know, and other people have said, I may not be able to give them cash, but that hospitality doesn't always mean cash. And so some people have like a little goodie bag, you know, a bottle of water and some uh, a few candies or whatever. It, it, there's actually some wisdom in what you might put in a, a Ziploc bag, a big Ziploc, uh, to say, this is what I can give to people, but I can't just, I don't feel like I can give away money. Uh, I, I do think the pastor um, who says, I just always keep a few bucks in my car has kind of convicted me uh, because I, I think I'm probably just like every other American uh, who doesn't plan for it and, and sometimes when it's over you feel guilty because I didn't do anything. I don't have any cash, right? And uh, it used to be a, maybe a lie saying I don't have any cash. Um, but now we're, we're all plastic, you know, debit cards and whatever. And if we <laughs> say I don't have any cash, uh, it might be the truth. But it just means we didn't plan to have anything to give away for those who are in need, right? That's the thing. Is But you could have, if you'd have thought, to have some way to show hospitality. Now, I'm not trying to lay a burden of caring for beggars. You may say, uh, my planned hospitality is to support this ministry or these uh, to, to do the under these circumstances. That's how I know I can do it my way, right? Without being um, kind of lost in... Uh, you know, nickel here, dime there, nickel here, dime there. Uh, and, and so everybody, I'm not trying to tell you how to do it, but we are told to show hospitality to strangers, to extend kindness and giving and generosity in such a way as we think is wise and is as needed, right? It's wise and that you don't set yourself up for, uh, be, you know, danger or, you know, whatever but how can you help someone in need, right? All right, so uh, show hospitality to strangers because some have entertained angels. And I still, I'm not sure exactly what to do with that, except he says to do it, all right? Um, remember those who are in prison as though you were in prison with them. Wow, again, uh, even Christians, maybe I'm speaking for myself, but maybe I'm speaking for a lot of Christians to say, I don't always do that to remember those in prison. Now, I do think a case could be made to say that he's saying, remember your fellow Christians that are in prison. And that's worth noting also, even if you say, I'm just going to show kindness to Christians in prison because they're stuck in there and yet they're trying to be Christian, right? Okay, don't throw at me the idea of, you know, the, the false faith of someone who's trying to get out on parole, okay? I understand some people throw out a false Christianity, but 
there are Christian Christians in prison too, right? And we need to remember them, right? But I think also somehow if there's a way to remember in kindness or even in prayer the non-Christians that are in prison, maybe that they can come to faith and become Christians. And I know that happens. I know it happens that somehow through the ministry of chaplains or whatever, uh, some people come to faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, and that's a good thing. So if we're kind of those cynics and we don't want to be happy about people in prison, maybe you should. Maybe we can soften our hearts light enough to say, hey, Lord, show them some mercy. Not that he doesn't, but that we can wish that God would show them mercy for their sake. You know, wouldn't it be a good thing if people in prison came to Christ and came to faith? I think it would be wonderful, right? So remember those who are in prison as if you are in prison with them. And back then and still today, there are ways that we can show kindness to those too. I don't know how I'm trying to say to do that. Every situation is going to be different, especially if you don't live close to a prison, right? What could you do? I don't know. Um, uh, and those who are mistreated, you know, remember those who are mistreated. <laughs> uh, certainly. I think uh, for me, maybe that's to go out, you know, to my heart should go out to prisoners. Who are mistreated but maybe it's a different topic altogether remember those who endure mistreatment persecution abuse child abuse spousal abuse domestic abuse abuse from employers bullying at school doesn't it seem kind and right to be reminded that we should remember those who are mistreated and maybe it's Lord, remember me. I think I'm being mistreated, right? Someone please show me some kindness or mercy or help me get out of this. Help me, Lord, uh, by sending someone who can provide some care for me as I'm undergoing this mistreatment or persecution or something. Now, verse 4. Let, the marriage, be, let marriage be held in honor among all. And let the marriage bed be held undefiled, for God will judge the sensually immoral and adulterous. Okay, so I, this is going to sting us 21st century Americans, and it should. And it stings me too. Because, oh, okay, well, I'm not doing it. I think we have to remember that uh, he, he wants us to honor the whole institution, right? Let marriage be held in honor among all. Every one of us should honor the institution of marriage. How do you honor things? I thought about this today. How do we say, how do we describe that I'm showing honor to something? Uh, and, and I tried to think, what are some examples, even secular examples? Well, we might honor the president. Uh, even if we don't necessarily have a great sense of you know affection for the president we might say you're the president it's an honor to meet you i know i'm not getting into politics i'm not talking about any one president let's assume uh, uh, we're all talking about the president we love okay you're going to honor the president that you have loved right go back through time and just imagine that guy uh and and and, and so you would honor him and maybe it's not because you like the guy but you like you respect the office, right? A policeman. We might show uh, love and concern and care to policemen, maybe not because we know them, uh, they live on our street, but because of the job they do. Veterans. We just had Veterans Week uh, for all those watching this in another century. We just had Veterans Day. And everybody, the, the outpouring of love, I think, is always wonderful to show that someone says, what you have done as a veteran is important to us. And maybe in our own little way, we can say that to show you some honor, to give you honor. Uh, you would honor your, your parents. You would honor your favorite teacher and treat them with extra respect and love, right? So honoring someone is how you treat someone that you have deep love or respect for. You might not love the police, but you might respect them for what they do, right? 
uh, or, or anyone else that you might think is, is worthy of that honor. So what does he say here? He says marriage, the whole concept of marriage should be honored. He didn't even say Christian marriage or, or secular marriage. He just said marriage should be honored. When two people join together and they're not um, uh, doing this in a temporary way, uh, but they're doing this for life. That should be honored, right? And let the marriage bed be kept undefiled. Now, I said this is going to sting for us Americans because even if we say, well, I'm not the one he's talking to, I think we have to ask ourselves, have we honored it? Or have we looked the other way when it's not treated with honor, when it's not respected, when the, the marriage bed is not the marriage bed? All right. Now, I, I need to, I'm going to have to come clean, but I got it. I think I found a picture that I think kind of helps explain this to Americans. Okay. Americans kind of need to hear it like this. Maybe not all Americans, but people our day. Okay. Boyfriends do not get husband privileges. The end. <laughs> okay. Boyfriends do not get husband privileges. The end. That's it. That's it. That's what we're trying to say is a husband is a husband, a, a wife is a wife, and a boyfriend is not a husband or a wife, right? And a girlfriend is not a husband or a wife. And so there's certain privileges and there's certain boundaries uh, that uh, are, there's certain conditions, behaviors, expectations, whatever. I don't, that sounds all too contractual. But there's some things that are reserved for marriage. That even the, the boyfriend or girlfriend, really, it's against God's ways to have that be a boyfriend-girlfriend thing. But it should be something for husband and wife. And God gives it for husband and wife. And I think you get it. We're talking about the sexually immoral and adulterous. That's the verse 4. And, and so I don't know if I have to say any more in detail, except to say, God wants us to honor that. So uh, I'm guilty. Now I'm guilty just as a citizen, as a person in our community, because how many shows do I watch and do you watch where we like the show, but it does not portray marriage as a valuable treasure to be held by all? where uh, relationships are entered into lightly, where one night flings uh, happen and you just go, oh, that's part of the movie. Maybe they made a comedy of it because he found someone else tonight. Or, or maybe it's a, it's a romance and you go, oh, they got together. The two people that we needed the story to get together for, uh, at, to bring them together, now they've gotten together. And we forget. They're not married. And now, that's just as a citizen. Now, as a Christian, how many times do, do I look away and, and not address this among my fellow Christians? And as a pastor, uh, or you as a church, right? How often do we kind of go, hmm... Or maybe as a church, you say, I wish pastor would do something. I, and I under, understand. And I understand there have been many times where I have not addressed this. Now, maybe you don't, maybe people don't know that pa pastor has tried to have conversations with people. You don't know. And I don't know if any of you guys have tried to have conversations with people saying, that's not uh, what your God wants of you, right? He has something else he wants of you, which includes waiting, right? And things like that. And this is a tough subject because it's so accepted in our world, in our culture, and even we as Christians don't stand up to it like we should. And I'm talking about me too. Okay? Uh, but what does it say here? It's pretty clear. I mean, it speaks in a little bit of code language, but it's pretty clear. Let marriage be held in honor of all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Now, 
uh, dear American Christians, maybe you're saying, I'm guilty of being part of that at some point in my life. Come and know of the life of, and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is for you the forgiveness of sins. Right? Okay, so if you say, oh, what does it mean God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous? Well, come and, and be one who is forgiven by Christ. That that, that, that sexually immoral and adulterous uh, is washed away, and now you are a sinner forgiven by Christ. Okay? We all have our sins, okay? So I'm not going to try to pigeonhole this as some sort of a place where someone should be a complete pariah in society because every one of us and especially every one of us who comes and sits in the chair here at worship has our own sins present and past right and who knows what our future sins will be um, but this one I, I think we as Christians as American Christians really struggle to uh, actually take a stand on and I'm, I'm speaking for myself too Okay, well, let's get going because this is a whole chapter is not just about verse four. All right. Keep your life free from the love of money. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, don't get caught up in the riches of things and do not and be content with what you have. As Americans, right, we, we have so much luxury. We really do. And, and if we don't have luxury, we say I'm discontent until I can have more luxury. Right. I want the contraption, the contraption. I want the thing that you plug in and it has digital screens. I, I want, uh, you know, the, I don't, this food's not good enough. I want, you know, luxury food, right? I, uh, you know, and we sometimes raise our nose, even at food, which is just food. There's nothing wrong with it. We just think I can have better, right? Because we're so spoiled, Americans, right? <laughs> Sorry, that's what, what we are generally, most of us, it, you know, that we've forgotten how to be content with what we have. There must be something else out there I can have, I can get. Uh, I've got four, uh, four book bags, uh, but Pastor likes switching book bags around. He likes, you know, uh, so how many more book bags can I get? Uh, um, you know, and we could say, well, how many pairs of shoes do I have? You know, I've got way too many pairs of shoes. I couldn't, you know, if I wore one a day, it'd still take me three months. Uh, well, that's not me, but, um, but you know, sometimes we just have an abundance of things that we don't need because we go, oh, it's pretty, it's sparkly, I'll take it. And we're not content with simply what we have. Is what you have enough? Okay, that can be enough, right? Uh, be content with what you have. Now, this verse is good. It's proper. because No matter what the need is, uh, here in verse 5, he said, For God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. What good promise that is, right? Uh, are you in a lot? God has said he'll never leave you or forsake you. Are you in a little? God has said he will never leave you or forsake you, right? If you're in a lot, you may still feel like, I want more. There's a plenty of songs about wanting more. Um, and, and, uh, and greed, and God says, I'm enough. I'm always with you. All right? Now, if you're poor, you may be saying, I don't have enough. Right? Uh, there's a song, uh, uh, What About Me? It Isn't Fair. I Don't Have Enough, and I Want My Share. Uh, and it's actually supposed to be about a kid who doesn't have enough. But when I say it, it sounds like a whiner who's like, uh, I want the same as everybody else. But in the, in the story, it's a kid who's desperate because he doesn't believe he has enough. He just would like to have what other people have, right? And like a homeless kid or something like that. Uh, it's all these 70s, kind of 80s stuff, some, one song, song like that. All right. Uh, and so we can confidently say the Lord is my helper, right? Whether you have a lot or a little, you have God. You have your helping God. Uh, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Which is a rhetorical question. We go, oh, well, what can man do to me? <laughs> Let me count the ways, right? But it's a rhetorical question. If God is my helper, what can man really do to me? He can hurt me. He can stab me. He can kill me. He can, you know, cut me up. He can beat me up. It can hurt. Well, yeah, but the 
you will also have the Lord even in the darkest of times. So in other words, no matter what man does to me, hurt me, kick me, beat me, stab me, slice me, kill me, you still have the Lord through all of it. Right? So no matter what someone does to you, you have the Lord. He is your helper. Right? So verse 7. Remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So, uh, don't you know, turn, turn the page, I'm going to have to do this a few times. Remember your leaders, he says. And, and uh, those who spoke the word of God to you and consider their outcome and in, imitate their faith. Uh, okay, so this is good. And it's also nerve-wracking for some. All right, this is good. Remember my leaders and imitate their faith, right? So, uh, well, which leaders am I supposed to imitate? My teacher? My principal? My president? My governor? Right? Maybe your teacher, principal, president, governor uh, haven't had a faith that was worth imitating. No, he actually says, remember those who spoke to you the word of God and imitate their faith. So um, those who are uh, your, your leaders in the Christian faith are the people you should imitate. Isn't that amazing? I mean, it kind of actually makes sense. We want to imitate the basketball star, and we want to imitate uh, the soldier, or we want to imitate the superhero that's on the f science fiction movies. Um, but we're actually told to imitate um, people like our parents who shared the Word of God with us. We're actually told to imitate uh, people like Sunday school teachers who spoke the Word of God to us, or our pastor who spoke the word of God to us, certainly, right? Uh, and so, remember and imitate their faith, right? You don't have to imitate me on dumb things. <laughs> you don't have to imitate my sins. No, and you don't have to imitate my hobbies. Goodness, everybody needs better hobbies than I have, right? You don't need to become a science fiction geek, a superhero nerd. Like, like me, right? You don't have to do that. You don't have to have my musical tastes. He says, imitate their faith, right? So if you have a pastor or, or a Sunday school teacher or a, a parent or a grandparent who shared the Christian faith with you, who shared with you the Word of God, or anyone else who became a sort of example to you, a model character, of what it is to be a Christian. He actually says, those are the people you should look after and imitate. Those should be your role models. If you like King Arthur and Robin Hood and Captain America, right? Like a kind of a geek like me, uh, I, I kind of want to be like King Arthur with a code of conduct. I want to be like Robin Hood, adventurous and, and uh, looking out for the poor. I want to be like Captain America, doing what's right and honorable. Well, okay, but... He actually says, remember the people who read bedtime stories to you from the Bible. The Bible stories. Remember your Sunday school teachers. I always loved hearing of David and Goliath. But of course, 
It's a fascinating story. You know, but you love to hear some of these stories. But those are the stories of our faith, to hear of Jesus Christ, to hear of people who sin and then find out that they can be forgiven, to hear of people who hold strong in the faith and witness to Jesus Christ, even under persecution. He says, remember the people who told you those stories. Remember the pastor who taught you Bible class, who preached to you. Remember the one who preaches to you now. I'm not trying to make this about me. But the Bible says, remember those leaders who share the word of God with you and imitate their faith. Right? <laughs> their faith, right? Don't imitate all the wrong things about me or anybody else. Their faith. Learn, learn the faith from these people. Right? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. So if you say, well, that was Grandpa's church. And that was Grandma's time. And she had a cute little church. And she'd go every Sunday. Grandma would. Well, good. And Jesus Christ hasn't changed. So if Grandma went to church, maybe she knew something that we need to listen to, right? Maybe we need to go to church too. I'm not just trying to beat up on that. But, you know, maybe it's Grandma knew something about Jesus. And maybe we should imitate Grandma's faith. Right? And we always, sometimes Grandma's are, you know, our weak, little sweet Grandma. And, and we love her, but we're not anything like her. You know, we love you, Grandma, and then we go out and do all of our 21st century crazy wild child things. Uh, maybe we should imitate Grandma's faith. Right? Okay. Uh, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever, it says. And this is worth knowing because if Jesus Christ was good and merciful yesterday, he is today and he always will be, right? If Jesus Christ is forgiving yesterday, he is today and he always will be. If the, the Jesus that you find in the Bible is the Jesus you will find today. And this is the Jesus who will always be with you. So if you think, maybe one day I can't trust Jesus uh, because I got trust issues, uh, we are mistaken, right? You can always, if you can trust yesterday's Jesus, if you can trust today's Jesus, don't be afraid that Jesus will change. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, forever. He doesn't change. His promises don't change. He doesn't say, I wish I would have done something else with you. No. Uh, when he decided to do something, he's the same yesterday and today and forever. We're the ones that change. We're the ones that change so much at times that uh, it's embarrassing. It's regretful. Why did I stop doing this? Why did I stop doing that? Why didn't I listen that day? I listened so many other times. Why did I suddenly think church wasn't worth it? Why did I suddenly think I didn't need to listen to uh, any kind of spiritual authority? I could just go my own way. Um, we're the ones who change. But God in his mercy does not change. He's the same yesterday and today and forever. So it says, verse 9, So do not be led astray by stra diverse and strange teachings. This is good. You know, that simple uh, biblical doctrine. We don't like to think of the word doctrine. At least America doesn't. Uh, you and your doctrines. Yeah, that means teachings. <laughs> right? Um don't be led astray by anything divisive, by strange teachings, any new teachings that's not from the Bible or it's not how the Bible has always been taught. Don't be led astray from that. Find the one true unchanging message of the scriptures, which means you may need to listen to the messages of different churches to say, to say are they preaching Christ? Are they preaching the Bible? Or are they really twisting it up? and not giving us a biblical message, all right? And and so uh, it's not uh, for the heart to be strengthened by, okay, wait, wait. Uh, it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, right? So again, kind of a, uh, we're not just talking about the observance of food laws, you know. Well, if I become a Christian, I have to give up smoking and drinking. Um, okay, all comments about health benefits or health problems aside the bible actually doesn't say take uh, give up smoking and drinking okay alcohol is actually commended to you in, in responsible use and uh, smoking's never mentioned such in that way uh, smoking's never mentioned such in that way but are, we are told to care for our body and not damage it so 
uh, I'll leave the idea of smoking or smoking cigars or smoking pipes or smoking smoking uh, to your judgment about the common knowledge that's around today okay all right um, so but he says uh, uh, there are some things that are holy you know some of the foods that the priests could take home and share with people but some of the foods like the holy sacrifices for sin uh, some of the, the sacrifices were not to be food uh, they were to be taken and cons consumed by fire and then the rest is burned outside the camp and there he kind of transitions to talk of Jesus just as Jesus the sacrifice was taken outside the city gates and there was sacrificed away from the community so that there would be forgiveness the punishment is taken outside the community so that the mercy is inside the community that's what it means he was sacrificed he was crucified outside the city gates outside the city walls away from the people meaning the punishment was away from the people right that's the point of that and so he is taken out of there and, and is crucified and he bears the reproach and so we say uh uh, here we have no lasting city uh, it is through him let us continue offering up a, a, a sacrifice of praise to God right so if Jesus left the city for the sacrifice uh, it kind of says uh, also for us well he saved us the people kind of in the community but uh, there's something also there and you'll have to kind of see it or dig through uh, that we also have no lasting city. We may be called away from the city. Uh, we may be called, now in some ways, we may be called through Christ to do something away from our culture. I don't know, you know, examples what that might be, but don't, don't be too in love with the world around you, right? And its values. Uh, be more in love with the values of the one who would be sacrificed, right? Um, but uh, also I think this um, reminds us to not you know not love the world too much um, and, but also go where we have to go for Christ I don't know what that means in today's society so, you know am I trying to say we should hide in the mountains no I don't think that that's given for us to do uh, I don't think that that's called for to go hide away from people but there may be times where we have to pull away from a certain participation in society there may be times where we say I don't I don't go to that activity because there's uh, there's no Christ in it and there's no witness for me in it not to receive a witness but there's no way I'd be able to give a witness and maybe my witness is to abstain from going right to <laughs> I can't go be part of that thing it's just so wrong there's no point for me to be in it so my, I actually make a stand by being out of it, right? This is a strange way of our world. At times we live in the world, but we don't always participate like the world, right? We are in the world, but not of the world. That's, that's how we say it, all right? Um, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. <laughs> Don't neglect to do good. Now, that's worth remembering for us lazy Christians. Uh, sometimes me too, right? Step up. There's good to be done, right? And, and maybe it's that uh, I don't even know if uh, I could do more. Maybe I should go help out at a soup kitchen. I know some of you guys have uh, uh, Christmas Day activities for the poor. Some of you guys have thanksgiving days activities for the poor maybe it's not some of my viewers but some people i know in this community you know that uh that even their holidays they would say part of this day belongs to those who are less fortunate that i can try to give something for them uh so sometimes people are you know uh, they're the they're the ones who say i go to the soup kitchen and help i go to this place and help and i or uh, I know someone, I take my dog uh, to, to the elderly, and it helps them, right? Like a comfort dog uh, going to a nursing home or something like that. Oh, what good. Do not neglect to do the good and to share what you have. Um, a lot of us don't play well with others, and a lot of us don't share our toys, do we? 
uh, take that to heart, right? God has given us everything. If we give it away, maybe maybe we share it for a minute and maybe we're afraid to share because he'll break it or I'll never get it back. Well, okay, then you know, talk to him and say, look, this is real important to me. I'll let you borrow it. I need it back, right? And if someone breaks it, you know what? Uh, sometimes things are meant to be used, right? Um, I said the other, a uh, couple weeks ago, I said a Bible is like a lawnmower. It's meant to be used and sometimes it wears out, right? So uh, share. We're kind of called to share. Don't hold our stuff too tightly. Let it be God's stuff that we take care of. And maybe we say, maybe God wants me to let them take care of it for a minute. Or maybe God lets me, wants me to let them uh, use it. And it, if it breaks, it breaks. Right? Now, I don't know. I'm not telling you to give away Grandma's pearls or anything like that. Uh, but, you know, we're being told to share what we have so that others may be benefited. And these sacrifices are pleasing to God. Okay? Now, uh, coming into down the wire here probably a little bit, uh, five minutes obey your teachers and submit to them for they are keeping watch over your souls and those who will have to give an account let them do this with joy and not with groaning for that would be of no advantage to you okay uh again i feel uncomfortable because it's not i i i'm a pastor right and that's what it's saying here obey your leaders they have to give account for your souls right so yes i'm i'm a i'm a leader in the faith and yes, I have to try, I'm, I'm being told that part of my work is I'll have to account for how did I serve your soul? How did I serve you in faith? But I don't want to insist that you obey me, right? Uh, so, you know, I, hopefully this is honest humility where I'm saying it's not about me needing you to obey me. Uh, it, it's saying that in the church, it seems to be saying God is saying, well, if they're your leader, then do what they say, right? That's when it's good and proper, right? When it's good and proper, do what they say, right? Don't do things that are stupid just because I told you to do it. Don't do stupid things because I said so, right? Disobey me when I'm dumb, <laughs> all right? Okay, um, but now think about what it says. So, okay, obey your church leaders because they keep watch over your souls. This is the scary part. I, I'm keep your watch over your souls you know pastor it has to kind of say that they're my flock and that they're, they're not just oh well, they're my customers you know they're they're like uh guests at my library no i'm, I'm there's an accountability there they were i'm if i have become your pastor uh, i and your your faith leader there's an accountability that i have to try to help you in faith and to try to help you away from danger, th you know, things that are dangerous to your Christian faith or danger, you know, and this is the very sobering part for a pastor. They keep watch over your souls. And so he says, so let them do this with joy and not with groaning, right? <laughs> so the writer to the Hebrews is basically saying, don't make your pastor's job too hard needlessly. Let them enjoy it to be your pastor. Now, let's pretend I've moved on and we're talking about someone else, not me. I'm, let's, he's still talking this. He said this for 2,000 years. He's not just saying, obey Pastor Yoakum. No, he's saying when you have a faith leader, when you have a leader, a pastor, a priest, a minister in, uh, in the Christian church, they do have to look out for you. So uh, don't make their job too hard, right? Let them enjoy looking out for your life right and and uh it is a joy at times to be a pastor i just got to go visit someone in the hospital and uh, you know my love to that person is in the hospital i hope that they get better and i'm not trying to say that they won't i'm just saying that is my deep desire that they get better but it's also a joy to be with them in the hospital and to, to uh, not only sit with them and just be some comfort and company, but also to say, we have Christ who's going to get us through this. How? I don't know, but we have Christ who's going to get us through this. 
All right, uh, verse 18 and following. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience desiring to act honorably in all things. I urge you the more earnestly to do this in order that I may be restored to you the sooner. Now, what a beautiful little thing there is. You know, uh, here he's saying, please pray for me. Pray for us, whoever the us is. Um, uh, we desire to act honorably in all things. You know, someone who is trying to say, I have a clear conscience. I'm not trying to misbehave. I want to do this right, you know, and, and I want to do it honorably. And so please pray for me that I can um, do this right, right? And th these are pastors or missionaries or apostles, maybe we can think. Um, all right, verse 26, or verse 20. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. This is a blessing, uh, a wonderful benediction and blessing. And, and just picture your, that someone is saying this to you. Now, for you... All right, this is my last comment then. All right, imagine this is someone saying this to you. I want you to have the God of peace. I want the God of peace, the one who brought Jesus back to life, the one who brought Jesus, who is our great shepherd of the sheep, Jesus Christ, back to life, the, the one who, of this Jesus, the blood of the eternal covenant uh, has been paid right and it, may this god equip you give you everything you need that is good so that you can do what god wants and i want you to have this so that you can do his will and then in doing this may god be through you be working in all of us that which is pleasing in god's sight through jesus christ praise jesus you know to whom be glory forever and ever amen now, this is a huge blessing May this God, the God of the risen Savior, the God of our salvation, also give you everything you need to do the work that God gives you to do so that we're all blessed in Jesus Christ. What a blessing. What a blessing. All right, there's uh, uh, three, four more verses. Read them. Go find Hebrews chapter 13 and read them. That's your homework, okay? But let's close uh, this time in prayer now. Uh, we pray, as I often do, I take the prayers that are kind of included in the study notes of the Lutheran Study Bible. Let us pray. O God, through the blood of Christ's covenant, make us complete in your sight and cause us to do your will. Amen. All right, so that's the book of Hebrews. That was We've taken many months to do, and next week we'll get back into John all right, what a good gospel that is too. All right, so God's blessings on your day and your week.